when you actually dig into these stories, what you see so often is that, quote, the people is really only a few people. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. The rumors are true. We are indeed back here at the Lions of Liberty podcast, where I strive to advance the ideas of liberty at least twice a week or so. Today's episode is number 145. You can find the show notes for today's show at lionsofliberty.com slash 145. Today's show is sponsored by our friends at Health Excellence Select, an amazing, affordable alternative to Obamacare insurance. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. We are also sponsored by our good friend Dan McCall over at Liberty Maniacs, who has filled my drawer with awesome Liberty and satirical shirts. If you want a 10% discount on your entire order, you can use the discount code Lions of Liberty at checkout. That's LibertyManiacs.com. My guest today is the creative media producer at the Charles Koch Institute as well as the founder of his own production company, Citizen A Media. He recently completed production on a documentary entitled Farming in Fear, which recently won the Excellence in Filmmaking and Audience Choice Awards at the Anthem Film Festival, a part of Freedom Fest in Las Vegas this past July. Sean Malone, welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Hey man, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, Sean, I'm excited to talk to you about Farming in Fear. I've seen the trailer, I've read a lot of Martha's story, and I greatly look forward to seeing the full film. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but first I want to get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you start off just telling us kind of how you got here. How did you first become interested in the ideas of liberty, and how did you find yourself doing this for a living, making videos concerning liberty issues? The origin started actually, I mean really as far back as I can remember thinking politically about anything or thinking philosophically about anything. I was probably 13, 14 years old, I started asking some questions myself about what I believed. And and the thing that, that really set me off, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, was just the simple question of who owns me, right? Who is it that has or should have control over my life? And more importantly, of any human, right? So like, should anybody have somebody else who actually owns them? My answer to that question, which is that, you know, I own me and every individual is a self-owner in that sense that they control what they think, what they do. They're the ones who are the moral agents in, independently, you know. The answer to that question led me a lot of places, but in general, it led me right towards what I didn't know was called libertarianism at the time. And that, you know, over time, I kind of realized that that's the category I sort of find myself in. That's a common thread. It seems like a lot of people sort of come to these ideas in one way or another, whether it's just through thinking things through or, or getting some question asked. I'm curious, actually, how that question came up, because it seems so obvious on its face. Yes, it's my body. I own it. And yet, clearly, that isn't being applied you know, very accurately in today's society. So how did you even get that question kind of turning in your mind in the first place? I honestly can't really remember at this point. I mean, I think like a lot of libertarians, I have a little bit of an iconoclastic streak. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's shocking. But, you know, I think that when I was a kid, when you're 14, 15 years old, you're, I think most people are starting to ask questions about who they are and, and what they think about things and what their lives mean, you know? And for me, that was just something that was a question that was highly on my mind. Like, who are the people who should dictate to others how they act, what they believe, what they do? You know, and I had a lot of religious friends at the time who believed that God, for example, had a plan or had, you know, other authority figures were the controlling factor in, in what people did. And that never really made a lot of sense to me. So I, I, I don't know. I think it's, it was just something that was always on my mind. And then eventually I started to formalize that. And then that one question really, like I said, it really led to a lot of other places, which is pretty cool. I mean, like starting with a fairly simple question and working through conclusions from that premise led me where I am today. And how were you able to merge that interest and, and this newfound discovery of libertarianism once you finally found that there's actually a name for the system of beliefs that you have? How are you able to translate that into this really cool career that you have, really combining that with your passion for video production and, you know, to this point where you're actually doing this full time and, and making videos about extremely important topics like the one we'll talk about in a minute? 
somewhat of a, I don't want to call it a fluke because it was definitely a, a goal that I set out for myself, but I did not originally, when I was younger, I had no intention of being a, a libertarian professionally in any kind of a way. It never really occurred to me. It was just what I was interested in was actually music. Originally went to school for music performance as a percussionist. I was a jazz drummer and a jazz vibraphonist. I had written a little bit, but a couple years in, I switched to a composition degree. And then I, I continued on that path, got really interested in filmmaking and in video production. So I did that a little bit as a job when I was in college. And then I went to graduate school basically for composition for film and multimedia, so film scoring at New York University. So after I got my master's degree, I went to Los Angeles and I worked as a, as a music manager and a, and a music editor and spent, you know, the next, gosh, you know, three, four years just doing entertainment industry work, you know, not politically focused at all. What happened for me, though, was that 2008, 2009, you know, really coming off of the financial crisis or right in the middle of the financial crisis. And I was looking at what media was available from the libertarian organizations that I read on a daily basis. You know, at the time it was Cato and Mises Reason. You know, nobody, with, apart from somewhat reason, keep in mind this is, you know, this is 2007, 8, 9, that territory. Before it was cool to be libertarian, I guess. Well, before it was cool, but... <laughs> But before anybody had any kind of multimedia production. Right. So Reason was the only one who was sort of doing Reason TV. But that was in its pretty early stages at that time. I mean, I think they only had three or four producers working then, you know. So I was looking at the state of what we had to offer in terms of communicating with people in a way that people actually want to be communicated with. And it just wasn't there at all. So I had a, uh, I had a roommate in Los Angeles who worked as an editor for a small video production house that small, but kind of, you know, they worked on fairly significant projects, mostly trailers and things like that. But they did a, a job for the state department and for Hillary Clinton. Their um, CEO was a friend of Hillary's. They got this gig. I think it was a piece about water rights. Like what it was about didn't really matter to me that much. Essentially, it was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent by the State Department to advertise something the State Department wanted to do. It was narrated by Matt Damon. <laughs> it had gorgeous, gorgeous imagery, gorgeous music. Everything about it was so professional and so well done. It was only about four minutes long. And it was basically give the government more money, you know. <laughs> and, and I thought about that. That was sort of an epiphany moment for me because I looked at that and then I looked at the two-hour academic lectures that were filmed at the back of the room that you could get from Cato or some, something like that. Where, and I would go, this, uh, these aren't the same. We need Matt Damon quality here. So we, need, we need Matt Damon. And, uh, of course, Reason got Matt Damon a couple years later, so that was good for him back <laughs> So I, I literally set out, and, and I have blog posts from back in, I think, 2009, where I or really just set out and said, look, I think I can participate here. I think I can add something, and I'd like to, within a couple years, become a producer of explicitly libertarian media content and, you know, try to be a part of, of the group that raised the bar. And, you know, I think to a large extent, at the time, there just weren't that many of us who were doing it, so... I may have jumped in at kind of the right time, which, you know, like I said, it's kind of allowed me to, to do this professionally now. Well, awesome stuff, man. And, you know, you worked on a lot of stuff for Reason and this recent documentary, which we'll discuss here. And obviously we can't cover the full story you lay out in Farming in Fear. But uh, if you could just kind of give us the gist, what is the sort of elevator speech version, you might say, of Martha Bonetta's story that, that you present in Farming in Fear? Yeah, Martha Bonetta, and I'll, I'll get into how I met her and stuff in a bit, but Martha Bonetta is a young woman. She had a dream from childhood to just run a little organic farm, and she bought a 64-acre farm in a place called Fauquier County, Virginia. It's near Paris, Virginia, if you're looking on a map. And she thought she was going to get this farm. At the time, she believed it was a historic property, and she was going to use organic sort of free range 
historical farming practices on it. it shouldn't have been a problem she was really excited to do this and what she found pretty much from the beginning the moment she first tried to sort of renovate the barn and and the property a little bit to bring animals on and to plant crops she found that a consistent and frankly pretty involved web of local politicians an environmental group that is supposedly protecting the historical and agricultural value of the land and the former owner of the property were basically colluding to prevent her from doing what she wanted to do. It's a pretty shocking story and it's a pretty involved story, but the essence of it really is that we have a lot of local forces working against Martha's just right to do what she wanted with her property. It was pretty crazy. How did you first encounter Martha's story and how did this whole thing come together to the point where you guys decided to fund and, and film this documentary? A few years ago, in 2012, I had not done a longer form documentary with the Koch Institute at that point. I, I was trying to convince them to to fund something like that. And I had done a few shorter little pieces, little test pieces that were kind of human interest stories, uh, four or five minutes long. One of those was a piece that I ended up doing based on a hearing. It's basically a, a zoning board of appeals hearing that Martha was engaged in to try to defend herself from some of these attacks. And the way I found out about it was that originally we had heard, because there were uh, local news reports and things, of wineries in the same area dealing with some of the same kinds of stuff. There was a lot of kind of corrupt zoning restrictions Things that were basically saying for the wineries, they said that they couldn't have anybody out on their farms after 6 p.m. They could only have a limited number of people there. They couldn't have people there on the weekends, things like that. And, of course, for a winery, you know, that basically is a killer. That's when all the fun happens. Yeah, you can't host wine tastings. You can't have weddings. You can't do any of this kind of stuff. So we originally heard about the area through the wineries, but it turned out that the wineries have money and some clout. And so pretty quickly, the wineries all kind of banded together and carved out some exceptions to some of these policies. Martha and the other farmers in the area weren't really able to do that. We ultimately heard then about a story of a woman, Martha, being fined $5,000 a day per infraction on three infractions basically for selling produce off of her own farm directly to consumers and for hosting a birthday party for eight 10-year-old girls without getting a special events permit to do that. And these were infractions that were basically violating the state government regulations? Or where do these infractions come from? Who, who's the enforcement body? It's the county zoning ordinances. And that's how I heard about it. What I ended up learning subsequently was that that was just one attack in dozens and dozens of using different methods of, of going after her and doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, one of the other things that happened to her was one of her neighbors claimed that she had abused horses on her property. They had called animal control. Animal control came out and found that nothing was actually wrong with any of the animals. She had somebody actually try to buy her mortgage directly from the bank. Fortunately, her bank notified her of, of the interest and told the prospective buyer no. In the end, she actually even had an, an IRS audit. Um, another thing I learned through this process is that the county level government actually employs a lobbyist to lobby the state government to keep power in the hands of, of the county, which was pretty interesting. There's just an awful lot of stuff that she had gone through for about 10 years. But the thing that sparked my interest was the birthday party. So when she did the appeals hearing on those zoning citations, I went down and produced a, a four or five minute piece on that. And that got her a bunch of media attention. So once I convinced the Koch Institute to start funding longer form pieces, I did a couple other documentaries with the Honest Enterprise Project, which this is a part of. And Martha and I kept in touch, and by the time I got to the point where I was ready to do a third with this series, Martha's story had continued to become 
a shocking issue that seemed worth doing and and so that's that's why we ended up choosing that as part of that set so what do you think is the source for all these problems that martha was seeing is it essentially kind of crony capitalist protectionism are there bigger farms that are trying to enact these rules to sort of crowd out the smaller farms or was this sort of like a freak occurrence is this something that was more maybe on a personal local level or or is this something that we can see in in many other instances throughout other states and throughout the country There is a little bit of that. First of all, I think everybody who's really involved against Martha had kind of their own motives. I think the county had some interest in just keeping, maintaining power and and controlling the area. The environmental group called the Piedmont Environmental Council has a longstanding history of preventing development and any kind of commercial activity in the area. And the former owners of the property had put it into an easement They're sort of in estate planning mode, and my theory, at least, is that their biggest involvement was that they really just had a property was supposed to be used as, and a commercial farm was not on that list, even though they claim it's it's farmland. I mean, what else are you going to use farmland for? (laughs) Well, except the farm. So, I mean, the thing is, uh, Phil Thomas is is this guy who's the former owner of the land, and he was a fifth generation landowner in. Northern Virginia. His father was the president of the Fox Hunting Club and owned a lot of real estate in that area. He actually also owns a real estate company. And Martha and there are some other people who have different theories on this, but I've said a bunch of times that I think if Martha had just gone on the farm, bought the land, and just put a horse, one horse there, never had anybody visit, never had any commercial activity. I think she'd have been fine. I don't think she'd have been targeted for the kind of harassment that she's experienced over the last few years. I think it's the fact that she decided to make it a working farm, to sell produce, to sell eggs and goat's milk and soap and all that kind of thing. I think that because she did that and because that meant traffic coming out to the area, I think that's what really, really did it. That said, I do. there are, like I said, a few other theories Some people believe that her farm – that people are actually trying to push her off the farm so they can get the land back and resell it maybe to somebody else. She has done a lot of renovation work. It's worth a lot more today than it was when they originally bought it. And if they can sort of kick her off from a legal standpoint, there is a theory that goes that people could get it cheaply and then resell it. There's also a theory that her land, which sort of sits in a basin – has a lot of water that people might want. I'm not sure. I haven't seen a lot of incontrovertible evidence for those theories. What I have seen is a lot of evidence for anti-growth, anti-commercial nimbyism, basically, not in my backyard, just people who do not want commercial activity happening in that area. And sadly, in today's society, the way people view government and politics, if people don't want something, they immediately turn to government and say, I don't want that. Stop it. I don't want that. Use the force of, of government to put a stop to it. And to and unfortunately, that's what's kind of unfolding with Martha. And, uh, and I'm sure there are similar examples that are unfolding all over the country. Uh, it's just great that you're able to sort of focus on this one instance of injustice and really dig deep into it and analyze it. Uh, Sean, I'm curious. Obviously, you probably learned a lot about not just the situation, but about how government at every level can regulate farming and, and regulate a lot of farmers out of business. So I'm curious, what is the most shocking thing that you learned while producing this documentary, if you had to nail it down? Um, I think, uh, gosh, that's, that's kind of a tough question. I'm seriously, so many things in this. One of the things that was the hardest as an editor to deal with was the fact that this story has so many layers and so many facets. Honing it down into a, hopefully a fairly clear story, uh, was really actually very hard in this case. Um, I think probably the most shocking thing to me, because, I mean, I've been around this stuff for a while, so a lot of it didn't surprise me, per se. (laughs) There's a lot of things that I've seen in other cases. Um, I think the thing that would shock probably most people is the really uncivil, I guess, arguments and really mean-spiritedness that comes through some of the attacks that she's dealt with. At one of the public hearings, the argument 
if Martha was allowed to have commercial development on her farm, not development in the sense of uh, commercial activity, I guess I mean. She wasn't planning on building anything new on it. But if Martha was allowed to to run a commercial farm, there were claims that she was going to build a strip club. There were claims that she was going to – there was some claim that she was going to have a prison – on her property that then released inmates or something onto the, there were some crazy, crazy accusations of what she was planning on doing with the land. And I think that that might be one of the more shocking things. People will stoop to a lot of lengths to defame people's character when they're trying to prevent them from doing something via legislation I think the other thing that would shock a lot of people is how well connected all of the antagonists really are here. I mean, there are people who are on the Piedmont Environmental Council who are also in the County Board of Supervisors office or in the County Zoning Board. Phil Thomas is, you know, like really closely connected to both the political side and the easement management side. There's a network here that are all talking to each other, emailing each other. They're all participating in this, in this process. And I think a lot of people who don't see a lot of this stuff, don't go to their city council meetings, don't involve themselves in this world, I think tend to assume that government works for, quote unquote, the people. But when you actually dig into these stories, what you see so often is that quote, the people is really only a few people. Right. The people that are being represented in the certain cases, that term the people is so broadly used it's so often, but it's really certain people that we need to be looking at in these cases. Yeah. Uh, Sean, I kind of have a sidebar question I wanted to ask you. I mean, it's no secret you work for the Charles Koch Institute and the Koch brothers, they seem to get vilified pretty much from every side of the spectrum. I, I'm sure you get a lot of this inflammatory feedback from time to time. Progressives will say how they are buying the government through all their spending on PACs and political campaigns, then you'll get some folks from sort of the Mises Lou Rockwell corner of the libertarian side who refer to them as the coctopus and, and that sort of thing and make them out to just be complete sellouts or status or what have you. Um, so, And I'm, I'm sure you get some of this stuff on your end. So what's your answer to that objection that, oh, the, you're, you're just working for the, the evil Koch brothers objection, I guess you might say, because, you know, you seem like a good guy to me. I see a lot of good content coming from that organization. So why do you think there is so so much, I guess, vilification of anything the Koch brothers touch, basically. I mean, I, I, you, you'll have to ask better people than me to see where where all of that vilification is coming from. I know that some of that comes from, you know, sort of a concerted effort to find a boogeyman. Um, that's at least that's sort of always been my take on it. My response, honestly, is is mostly to actually look at the stuff that we're doing. I, I think that one of the things that I've been really proud to participate in under the Koch Institute banner is, well, a lot, I mean, pretty much every single thing that we've done in the last four years that I've been there, I've, I've been extremely proud to be a part of. We started, when I first uh, started there, we were um, running a campaign to support economic freedom around the country and around the world. We've sort of gravitated more towards a broader set of issues where I'm sure you've heard about this in the news. We've been doing an awful lot on criminal justice reform in America, prison reform. Uh, a couple pieces I'm working on right now are about a prison entrepreneurship program, literally called the prison entrepreneurship program in Texas, which teaches inmates in a couple Texas prisons how to be entrepreneurs. They teach them character building skills and then they do a basically a Shark Tank style business plan competition inside prison. And then they have transition homes and support for these guys when they get out such that they have a 7% recidivism rate and a, I, I think, close to a 97, 98% employment rate for their guys after a year. I mean, I am right now getting to do things that I think a lot of people don't really know that at least – Charles, certainly, because I, I work for Charles specifically, but the Koch brothers in general are actually really engaged. I think criminal justice reform, um, economic freedom issues, free speech issues, you know, a more restrained foreign policy. All of these things are genuine concerns for certainly for our donor and for 
um, for the organization. And I, I would really just challenge people to look at what we're actually doing for the most part. Because I find that most of the criticism I get tends to come from people who aren't that familiar with our actual work. And that's the most important thing when analyzing any organization is their actual actions, whether it's the actions of government at some level or whether it's the actions of a, of a private institution like the Koch Institute. And as far as I can see, I mean, like I'm not sitting here, you know, analyzing their books and looking at every penny that they're spending, but I do see a lot of good coming out of that organization, including the work you've been doing and including the work you've been doing here on Farming and Fear. So I, I certainly do encourage you. I, don't, I know you don't need the encouragement because you're going to be doing it anyway, but to keep up the great work and, and keep doing what you're doing. And, um, why don't you just tell everybody before we sign off how they can view this film, how they can help get involved with uh, you know promoting it, with getting it out there, and, and when and where they'll actually be able to see the, the final film when it's completed. Well, this is what I'm actually super excited about. We're, uh, we're actually launching the full-on public release so you can see it online on the 30th, on September 30th. It'll be available at www.honestenterprise.tv. It should be uh, linked pretty conspicuously at charlescokeinstitute.org. And then you'll be able to see it on the Honest Enterprise YouTube, which you can just search for at Honest Enterprise, or it's just youtube.com slash Honest Enterprise TV. We haven't done a whole lot of screenings yet. So one of the things that we're going to do is expand the number of screenings that we have. Um, we've done a few. We've, we've shown it to a few student groups. We've obviously done uh, Freedom Fest, and we've done a Food Freedom Festival screening, which took place out where Joel Salatin, basically where Joel Salatin's farm is in Virginia. Joel, by the way, I was going to say this too, Joel's in the film, he made a, a point that you made, which is people, we've kind of lost an ethic of property rights in America, and people are very quick anymore to jump to using the government to stop something they just don't happen to like. And so Joel's in the film and, and uh, a few other people. Balin Linekin's a friend of mine who runs Keep Food Legal, and, and he talks about some of the national issues that happen you know, in terms of food regulation and food freedom issues. So I tried to broaden it out a little bit, but um, we hope to have some more screenings, and we, we definitely hope to have – everybody who who sees it be moved enough to share at least that's that's always my goal so um yeah on september 30th be on the lookout for it uh, online and uh, and we'll definitely be promoting it as much as we can perfect well i certainly look forward to seeing the film and i really hope it does well and i wish you the best of luck with it sean malone thank you for joining me today on the lions of liberty podcast thank you sir take care man all right guys i hope you enjoyed my conversation there with mr sean malone I've got some thoughts of my own and the last roar in just a minute, as I always do. But speaking of government overreach, like the government overreach that's been encroaching on the rights of Martha Bonetta, the government is overreached in some other ways, and that includes with our health care and our health insurance sticking their nose in, creating all these massive regulations, dictating what type of health insurance we have to buy, dictating that we all must buy it or face fines. But guys, there's an amazing alternative to this. And it's perfectly legal and perfectly qualifies for the Obamacare mandate. So you won't get fined if you participate in this. And it is called health sharing, where people voluntarily contribute funds to cover each other's health care. Our friends at Health Excellence Select have set up an amazing health sharing program for you. And they cover everything. They have personal assistants who will help you book appointments, help you find the right doctors that you need. They give you 24-7 Skype access to doctors so you don't even need to go to a doctor's office or make an appointment if it's not something serious. On top of that, you can get all sorts of discounts on medical and dental benefits. There are just so many great reasons to learn more about health sharing and about Health Excellence Select. To learn more, you can head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. You can also support our site by shopping over at LibertyManiacs.com, your home for political and satirical liberty-related gear, including t-shirts, mugs, hats, bumper stickers, potholders? I don't know if he's got potholders or not, guys, but he's got tons of cool stuff, and my drawers are rapidly filling up with t-shirts from Dan McCall over at Liberty Maniacs because you can get 10% off your entire order. You can do that by heading over to libertymaniacs.com slash pages slash lions, or by simply using the discount code Lions of Liberty. that's all one word, at checkout. So please do head on over to libertymaniacs.com and get some killer Liberty gear. All right, guys, and it is now time for the last roar. 
Is my branding working yet? I don't know. But I enjoy it. And because I like to roar. <laughs> I don't like just to talk. When I'm passionate about something, I like to roar about it. And I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about the ideas of liberty. And I'm very passionate specifically about the issue of property rights. Because if we look at just about any issue today and we break it down... Every injustice we see perpetrated through government pretty much comes down to a poor misconception of property rights. Now, at at the top of the show, Sean talked about how he first started thinking about the ideas of liberty, how he first started thinking about this stuff, and he did so by basically asking himself the question, who owns me? Who owns my body? And the answer, the obvious answer to to me and a lot of other liberty-minded people is, you do. He does. We own our own bodies. And by extension... We have to own any property that we legitimately acquire. Now, if, if I go down to my neighbor's house and steal his TV, well, I'm actually violating his property rights. And, and it's, it's not my legitimate property at this point. And that's why it can be very difficult to talk about property rights in our modern society because a lot of property that we have in society wasn't necessarily acquired legitimately. We have state governments who at some point in the past, somebody sort of dictated a line around them and said, this is the area that this government has sort of jurisdiction over. And at another level, well, the federal government did the same thing. They said, we have jurisdiction over all these borders and we can dictate what goes on inside the states. But none of this is necessarily based on property rights. So it shouldn't be a surprise when we see people get angry about something. Maybe it's just the commercial farm down the street and they don't like it for whatever reason. Well, the first thing they do is go back to that government and say, hey, stop that. I don't like it. But property rights and government should not be about what we don't like. We cannot initiate force on other people simply because we don't like what they're doing. Now, if what they're doing is actually a nuisance to us, if if Martha Bonetta moved into her farm and started causing pollution and this pollution started infecting the property of other people's neighbors, well, that's a totally different scenario. At that point, you do have the right to intervene. I would even say in our modern context, you have the right to ask the government to intervene on your behalf to protect your property rights. But again, this comes down to the concepts of property rights. We cannot violate other people's property rights just because we simply don't like whatever they might be doing on their property, even when it doesn't violate our own property rights at all. Now, you might say things like, okay, if we extend this to other areas, when we look at, say, something like prostitution. Now, a lot of people don't like the idea of prostitution. They certainly don't want prostitutes on their streets just offering up their services to anyone that walks by, especially if they have children. And that's certainly a legitimate concern. And how we need to look at this is, well, yeah, people should be able to form communities based on their adjoining private property rights and make any rules they so desire about communities. People should be able to ban people from you know selling their services on, on the street. They should be able to ban people from selling drugs on the street if they're opposed to the sale of those drugs on the street. What they cannot do is go outside the private property bounds and point around the world and just say, if you're committing this activity anywhere, well, we're going to use force to stop you. And this applies to situations where there is no real victim. In the case of a prostitute offering her service to someone and someone else accepting it, there's no victim there. No one's property rights have been violated. Unless they broke into somebody's house to uh, perpetrate this activity. I mean, there are always intricacies to every situation. But when we toss property rights aside, we just start using government to end everything that we don't like, to intervene in every area where we don't like something. Well, what we're really doing is we're inviting that upon ourselves eventually. When we're advocating for that system of property rights being thrown out the window, of government being used to simply intervene on any activities we deem that we don't like... Well, we're inviting eventual intervention upon ourselves as well. And that's kind of the point we are at in society now where government is being used by everybody to intervene all over the place against each other. That's why we see so many conflicts in our society. because we don't have a proper conception of individual rights, of property rights. And if we can work on that, even just a little bit, well, we might see a better world. If documentaries like Farming in Fear can open some people's eyes to these things, well, more power to them. And, I, and I'm glad there's Sean Malone out there making this documentary. Heck, I'm glad the Koch brothers are out there funding it. Now, a lot of people criticize the Koch brothers. I'm sure there are probably legitimate things to criticize them about. Again, I haven't looked at every single thing they've ever spent a dime on when it comes to government. But at the same time, we have to point out the good, and we always have to applaud the good that is being done. Heck, I wish I had Koch Brother money funding this podcast. Um, Not if it had strings attached, but, you know, there's a lot of good things that good people can do when they're funded by somebody. So, at least in the case of Sean Malone and his projects here, there's certainly good being done. So, it's fine to criticize the Koch Brothers. It's fine to criticize any government institution. It's fine to criticize all these people. But when we do so, we need to do so in a targeted way. We need to point at specific activities 
activities and say, this is wrong. This is a, a bad thing you're doing. If it's government violating property rights, we need to point at that and say, this is a bad thing you're doing. But if government protects property rights, we need to applaud that in those circumstances. You know, when government does something good, like a puppy, we need to sort of applaud it and praise it when it does well. That's how we encourage a better society. Even if we don't agree with the structure of our current government and that sort of thing, as I said earlier, it's not based on property rights, so there is a flaw from the beginning there. But we need to encourage all our institutions to do the right thing and discourage them from doing the wrong things. It's called consistency, people. That's what we strive for. That's what I strive for here at the Lions of Liberty podcast. We are published every single Monday and Thursday at lionsofliberty.com. There are so many ways you can hear this show. Of course, you can hear us over on iTunes, Stitcher, everywhere else you find podcasts. If you do subscribe on iTunes, I would love you to come over and give us an honest but hopefully good, rating and a review. That's one way you can really have out the show and really help us get the show in front of more people and, and keep this conversation going. You can hear us on the weekends. You might be hearing us right now on libertytalk.fm or on the Liberty Radio Network at lrn.fm. We'd like you to interact with us, so come on to our Facebook, facebook.com slash Lions of Liberty. Find us over on Twitter, at Lions of Liberty. If you want to really join the conversation, interact with myself, some of our past guests, and some of our contributors to this website, lionsofliberty.com. I'd like to invite you over to the Lions of Liberty Forum. You can just plug that into your little search bar on Facebook. It's a private group, but I assure you, as long as you uh, don't look like a fake Facebook profile or anything like that, I will let you right in and we can have all sorts of great discussions as we do each and every day there until next time folks there's only one more request i have and that is of course to live long and live free head of editing and mastering is john goblin